says it's okay. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Stories to Share. My name is Joe Steinfield and I am the moderator of this series. And we'll get right to it after the usual announcements. Uh, first, we have a new sponsor, Savings Bank of Walpole, and we're very grateful to the bank for joining Beltetz. Also a sponsor of Stories to Share. It somehow fell off this slide, but it'll be back next month. <laughs> and thanks to the sponsors, we are able to offer this series at no charge uh, for the community. And as I look around, many of you have been regulars and loyal from the beginning. Uh, and now, let's see, 860. This is our 18th program. And one feature of Stories to Share is that in order to be a speaker, you have to be from the Monadnock region. This is very much a local undertaking, and there's no shortage of people who live here uh, and who have interesting stories to share. And of course, today, we have such a person. Uh, I want to introduce someone. Is Laura Adams anywhere in sight, the new executive director? Well, I, we have a new executive director. Hello. Here she is. And the Civic Center is excited to have Laura joining us. And uh, as you can tell, we have a youthful, energetic person, and she will build on what her predecessors have done, including Becca Fredrickson, whom many of you know. Ed Watazek over here, uh, again, does the audiovisual with help from Sean Driscoll, and we thank you both. Uh, After today's program, don't leave. Come upstairs. Our caterer, Nancy Beltet, <laughs> has produced a wonderful spread. There are lots of books up there, so if you don't already have this book, you can get it. Cy will be there to sign it, along with Matt Patterson. And Matt Patterson is the illustrator of the book, and just so you'll get a good look. <laughs> Matt, could you stand up? Sigh in the background there. <laughs> well, Matt is a, he qualifies. He's from New Ipswich, now Hancock. He went to the Mass College of Art. He then illustrated a book that his father, a retired professor, wrote uh, about, I wrote it down, um, Freshwater Fish of the Northeast. And when I was speaking to Matt earlier, I said, I'm impressed. Anybody who can write off fishing trips as a business expense, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, Two or three years out of college, he won the prize in 2010, the National Outdoor Book Awards Design and Artistic Merit Award. There ought to be an acronym for that. Uh, and has been drawing wildlife ever since. And he's very much a partner with Cy Montgomery on this book. Cy is known to many of you, either personally or by her books. She was born in Germany and the daughter of an American hero, a general, a brigadier general, Austin Montgomery, who survived the death march in Bataan, was a prisoner of war, very distinguished person, uh, the winner of many awards, including the Distinguished Service, Me Service Medal uh, the uh, League of Merit, and a bunch of other awards. So 
we have here today the daughter of an American hero. Uh, as far as Sai herself, having been born in Germany, she grew up in various places, lived in Brooklyn, and ended up attending Syracuse University where she was something that I did not know existed, a triple major. I've heard of a triple threat, maybe it's the same. <laughs> she majored in journalism, French language and literature, merci, and psychology. I learned a minute ago that she actually had enough credits for a fourth major, but they didn't have room on the degree for that. <laughs> uh, incidentally, she had a classmate at Syracuse named Howard Mansfield, who incidentally married him. Uh, he writes very good books also. Now, I can't begin to list all of her awards or her books, but I want to, I love the names of the books. Here's one, The Good, Good Pig, The Soul of an Octopus. That is a book that, uh, when I read that book, I learned she doesn't write about animals. She becomes friends with them, and she gets to know them, and she lives with them, which is quite a quality. Uh, I hadn't thought of this point until this second. You may be the Thoreau of our time. <laughs> the Hummingbird's Gift, great book. Search for the Golden Moon Bear, and 32 other books. She's been called lots of things. <laughs> Here are three of them. Equal parts, poet and scientist. New York Times, part Indiana Jones, and part Emily Dickinson, <laughs> Boston Globe, and a modern miracle, body, that's B-A-W-D-Y, body, <laughs> brave, inventive, prophetic, hell-bent on loving this planet, book magazine. Doing what she does is not without risk. She's been chased by a gorilla, bitten by a vampire bat. She's held on to a wild tarantula. She's been undressed by an orangutan. <laughs> and here's my question of you. Are you insurable? <laughs> it's a great pleasure to introduce Simon Montgomery. Thank you so much, Joe, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, all my friends who are here to listen to me talk about some of my animal friends. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be joining so many of my other friends who will be speaking later as part of the series. So I'll be seeing you in a month for Dan Scully. <laughs> So I'm thrilled to be here with Matt today, and we're, I'm going to talk about our current book, but also I'll be starting with um, how I kind of got to do that project for of Time and Turtles. It just came out in September. Well, I want to start, as usual, with a great big hug from an octopus, an eight-armed hug. This is the last big book that I'd spent a bunch of years on, which came out in 2015. And this was a book that kind of let me explore an alien mind. I was so interested in, you know, what's it like to be someone who has not one bone in their body, who has three hearts, blue blood, can taste with their skin, can squirt ink, possesses venom, and whose mouth is located in their armpits. So this was something I wanted to experience firsthand. But that wasn't the only thing I wanted to explore in this book. The subtitle is A Surprising Exploration into the Wonder of Consciousness. Consciousness is considered one of the great mysteries, the great problems in philosophy. What is it? Who has it? What do we do with it? 
And I was interested in whether and how consciousness would manifest in a marine invertebrate so distantly related to us that we're separated by an evolutionary gulf of a half a billion years. So I needed to get to know these animals. And every week, I would visit the New England Aquarium. And I actually made friends with three beautiful giant Pacific octopuses. I learned from Jane Goodall, who, with Diane Fossey and Baruti Galdikas, was a subject of my first book, Walking with the Great Apes, that you can use not just your intellect, but also your heart as a tool of inquiry, getting to know your subject. And with every one of the animals that I've written about, I have fallen deeply and passionately in love. Well, several books later, after The Octopus, I, I did uh, one on uh, great white sharks. I got to, to be in a cage while great whites would come and approach me. I was interested to see how I would feel seeing a great white shark several feet from my face. I've got to admit that what I felt was not fear. But the first time I saw this beautiful animal approaching me, his name, by the way, was Jacques. They know all of these sharks. This was in Mexico off Guadalupe Island. That rather than feel fear, I felt a great sense of relief because someone who knew what they were doing was on hand in the ocean. And we don't know what we're doing to the ocean. As you probably know, by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. Well, I also had a chance to work with some other animals since then, including hummingbirds. Um, you had mentioned the hummingbird's gift. And hawks. I took falconry with a wonderful instructor who, alas, we lost to COVID. But somehow, after a bunch of these books, I managed to turn 60, looking rather like this. <laughs> and when I turned 60, I became interested in the second big mystery that philosophers grapple with. The first, as you know, is consciousness. The second is time. And when I turned 60, time felt different. And I was eager to explore what is it? Does it flow through us? Do we flow through it? Is it even real? Well, who would be better to accompany me on this journey exploring the mystery of time than turtles? Turtles are ancient creatures. They arose at the same time as the dinosaurs. And they live long lives, like we do, and sometimes older. The oldest turtle recorded lived to 288 years and only died recently. And that animal was alive when George Washington was with us. So I wanted to take a journey with turtles. And part of the reason that I was so drawn to turtles was this guy, who's also <laughs> sitting in the front row. <laughs> Matt and I met at an art show about seven years ago. And he is all about turtles. He proudly will tell you that he is a turtle nerd. His first memory when he was about three was going out in a rowboat with his dad looking for turtles. And his dad was totally his partner in turtle crime. And at one point when he was young, his dad held his son upside down by the ankles over an alligator pit so that Matt could pick up a turtle he wanted to examine. <laughs> These are some of Matt's earliest drawings. <laughs> and believe it or not, some of these were done when he was like four or five, and they're better than anything that I could do now. He met Myrtle, a celebrity turtle that some of you may know, who's now 90 years old, the uh, undisputed queen of the giant ocean tank at the, the uh, New England Aquarium. How many of you have met Myrtle? She's so great. She has more Facebook followers than we do. Um, and here he is, like. How old were you, five, four, four years old? And Myrtle is still there. And Matt is still making pictures of turtles. So 
he, intro he introduced me to the world of turtles. He's been all over the world with turtles. Here he is in Madagascar with radiated tortoise, one of the rarest and most beautiful tortoise species. Here he was just this summer in Belize working with some of those turtles and picking up some interesting stomach parasites. <laughs> well, through Matt, I began to learn the most amazing things about turtles. We think we know them. So many of us had turtles when we were little. I was one of them. If you were born in the 1950s, you were practically issued a baby <laughs> red or turtle, right? Your mother and father took you to Woolworths and you went home with one of those little bowls with a little plastic tree in it and this t darling little baby turtle who, in most cases, alas, soon got a soft shell and your mother flushed it and the next day went out and got you another one and told you it was the same turtle, but you knew it wasn't. Um, they, they call those little plastic bowls death bowls now because even though we loved our turtles, no one told us how to take care of them. They're not hard to take care of, but they do need certain things. Well, I had always loved turtles, but I had no idea how fascinating they are. This is a turtle that Matt has painted who is in a tree. Turtles, some of them, climb trees. Some of them even have prehensile tails, grasping tails, like South American monkeys, to help them do it. Some turtles look like they've had Botox lip treatments. <laughs> There's some turtles with necks longer than their, their shells, and some with googly eyes, and some with shells that glow in the dark. And there's turtles like this one below, who has the unusual talent of being able to pee out of its mouth. There's others, this is one of the ones with googly eyes. Some can actually move each eye separately. Um, and this is one of the, oh, did I mess up the turtles? This is the soft shell? That, that's the one who pees out of his mouth, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, he looks so similar, and I so identify with him because we, we both have kind of that same profile. <laughs> the other turtle that I just showed you, that's one of the fastest turtles. We think of turtles as slow, but there's actually turtles who can outrun a 10-year-old on the 100-yard dash. Pretty amazing critters. And there's turtles who look like they have six eyes. And there's, there's so many different kinds of turtles I wanted to help. So for this book that we um, did together that just came out, we volunteered with the Turtle Rescue League, which is located in Southbridge, Mass. Now, most projects have several different beginnings, but I'm going to share with you the beginning of our book. Page one, chapter one, the first time that we went to Turtle Rescue League to ask them for a favor. Amid all the other homes on the suburban street, white, beige, gray, pale blue, light yellow, one two-story salt box stands out. It's a blazing neon green. It's flamboyance accentuated by an equally electrifying violet shed out back. The house bears a sign in front that reads, Turtle Lover Parking Only. <laughs> Violators better shut the shell up. <laughs> Observed by closed circuit TV, one of several security measures taken because even sick or injured, turtles are so valuable on the black market that the patients here could be targets of abduction. Matt and I mount the steps to the wooden deck of the house and knock on the door. Alexia Bell, Turtle Rescue League's president, lets us in. Once inside, Matt and I carefully step over a knee-high wooden barricade to enter the living room. We're soon met with the reason for the barricade. Pizza Man. Pizza Man is a 20-year-old, 12-pound red-footed tortoise with a knobby back and black and yellow shell, and he's headed towards us like a slow-motion missile. High stepping on columnar legs, his toenails tapping softly on the wooden floor. He holds his pale bottom shell or plastron tall as he paces determinedly across the room. He stops two inches from my feet. He pointedly jerks his wizened head to the right, 
pulls it back to center, jerks it to the left, and then swings his neck back to center to stare directly up into my face. Such a spirited reaction from a turtle might come as a surprise. While most people like turtles, even many biologists dismissed the reptile's intellect as little more sophisticated than a pet rock compared with the size of their sometimes colossal bodies. A leatherback sea turtle can weigh over a ton. Turtles' brains are remarkably small, and that makes people think they're not very smart. But clearly, Pizza Man was giving me a, a welcome. This greeting was as obvious as shaking someone's hand or giving someone a, a hug. And the thing is, as soon as he finished greeting me, he walked over to Matt to give him a greeting, and there his ardor grew. Because Matt, as usual, in addition to his signature headband, was, as he is today, wearing flip-flops. And the cold-blooded reptile was delighted to stand on the warm tops of Matt's um, naked feet, <laughs> where he could then perform his greeting. And we thought this was a good sign, because we had come there to ask a favor. We had previously been to Turtle Rescue League one other time. We'd come to a turtle summit, which they had called inviting rehabbers, wildlife rehabilitators, to learn some of the techniques that they and others had pioneered to mend shattered shells and help turtles who'd been hit by cars, chewed by dogs, or had other horrible run-ins with the modern human world. We came away from this thing as stunned as if we had visited Lourdes. We saw pictures of turtles so messed up, I don't even want to show them to you. But one in particular that I'll never forget was a slide of a female snapper that they projected on the screen. The entire first third of the shell was completely shattered. Three of her legs were smashed. She had one eye. She'd been lying on the side of the road, cooking on the asphalt for hours before she was rescued. But two years later, that turtle was released, healed, back into the wild, perfectly fine, where she could lay eggs for decades and decades to come. Basically, Alexia said, if the turtle's organs aren't smeared all over the road, you may well be able to save her. And so on this day, we had come back to Turtle Rescue League to ask if we could be part of that miracle because we wanted to help broken creatures be made whole. So that's the beginning of the book. But a funny thing happened between this scene that I just read you and the next time we appeared, and that funny thing was COVID-19. We, of course, had no idea such a horrible thing was coming. And so interesting, though, because what was I writing about in addition to turtles was time. And during that lockdown, time stopped for so many of us. So many of the markers of our days, from the office, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, to school, to gatherings for holidays, birthday parties, graduations, even funerals. These disappeared. Time ground to a halt. But this was a great time for me to consider another way of marking our days, one that the turtles have had down pat for millions and millions of years. So this presented a fantastic opportunity for us. It was also a fantastic opportunity during this broken time when our country felt broken. The contagion was upon us. There was political divisions that pitted neighbors against neighbors. And there was environmental catastrophe. Remember, Australia was on fire, and um, the Amazon was on fire. California was on fire. During this time where it felt that the world was broken, Matt and I got to help put together the broken world. 
shell by shattered shell. So here's one of our first patients we met. He is named instantly Robin Hood for reasons that you can imagine. What happened to him was he'd been living in his pond for decades and decades quietly, not hurting anybody, and one day someone thought it would just be a great idea to shoot him in the neck with an arrow. So he comes to Turtle Rescue League and um, Natasha lets him in. Natasha is the co-founder of the league. Alexia makes money by fixing appliances. So she was at work. Now, Natasha does a lot of the egg incubation and a lot of the aftercare, but she does not do surgery for the excellent reason that Natasha is blind. So we had to wait for Alexia to come home from her day job. And we were hanging out with this guy. Well, we waited with hope because we had seen miracles occur at this place. Some of the injuries we saw were too gruesome to even show you, but they were turtles with, with smashed shells and broken plastrons. This turtle um, has, has got a, a piece of metal that's been put on him to fix that broken plastron. And then this guy, Chutney, he had everything you can imagine wrong with him. We met Chutney when he was just about healed. Chutney was a snapping turtle. He'd been hit by a car. It had broken his shell. It had broken his jaw, and most importantly, it had concussed his brain. So he didn't know which end was up. He kept rolling over and over on his back. And this was terrible because not only was it no good for his shell, but every time he did that, he used his strong neck and his chin. And poor Alexia had to reset that jaw. So Alexia and Natasha tried to come up with something that would keep him from rolling. They tried weighting him down, but that wouldn't work because of the injury on his back shell. They tried taping him down, and that didn't work either. But they finally came up with this brilliant solution, and it just shows how rehabbers so often MacGyver some brilliant solution. And what they came up with was called the chutney tube. And what it was was a clear plastic um, pitcher, just a normal plastic pitcher that you could see through. And he fit into it perfectly, but the best part about the pitcher was that it came with like a kickstand. It's handle. So he couldn't flip over. And soon enough, when the world stopped spinning, when his concussion was healed, he was going to be just fine. And we were actually, Matt and I were both there for Chutney's release into the wild. So. We had hope for our friend. Um, this guy also was repaired. Look at what happened to him. He was chewed by a dog. And we called him Mr. Pajamas, because he looked like he wasn't quite dressed. So Alexia finally gets home. And she puts him up on the examining table. And we can see that this is even worse than an arrow. This is actually the bolt of a crossbow. A crossbow is a medieval weapon that's used to pierce armor. But the amazing thing was, when she went to try to pull it out, it had actually, his skin had healed around it, like a tree will heal around a piece of barbed wire. That was kind of amazing, but it still had to come out. And it couldn't have been pleasant. I should point out that Robin Hood here is not anesthetized. He has no painkiller, and he is not being restrained. And this is a 30-pound adult snapping turtle. And her hands are right by his face, and she is doing something that must have hurt. She's pulling on this thing that's embedded in his skin. She's twisting. She's trying with all her might to pull the thing out. And this turtle never hissed, never bit, never snapped. He was very patient and sweet, and she pulled that thing out. And believe it or not, the guy who found him, he'd been called by, a, by a, um, an ACO, an um, animal control officer. He'd been told, there's a snapping turtle with an arrow in him somewhere in an eight-acre pond. He found him, brought him back. Mike Henry, 
was able to release him that very day. He was absolutely fine. And now it's time to introduce one of our favorite turtles at Turtle Rescue League. This is Fire Chief. Fire Chief was a 42-pound snapper who I would like to say is exactly my age. He's probably in his 60s somewhere. He could be older, but I do want to point out he is age appropriate and he was single. Although, <laughs> <laughs> we are crazy about this turtle. Here's what happened to him. In 2018, before we knew him, see he lived, he was called Fire Chief because he lived in a, a fire pond next to a fire station. All the firemen knew him, and they loved seeing this huge turtle who would sometimes come out, and every year um, he would come out in the spring and walk to this pond, and then he would leave the pond in the fall, so he'd hibernate in a different pond. So they would see him crossing the road. Well, one day he was unlucky crossing the road. A car hit him, and it smashed a shell and paralyzed his back legs and his tail. Well, the firemen, who are so brave that they will run into a burning building to rescue you, they loved this turtle, but they were too scared to pick up an angry, upset, snapping turtle. <laughs> so they call these two skinny ladies, one of who's blind, and they come rushing out in their ambulance. They even brought a kayak and went out in the pond, and they got him, they brought him back to Turtle Rescue League, fixed up a shell, and so by the time Matt and I met him, um, he had already begun to heal. His shell was healed, but his back legs were still weak. Well, we had a fantastic time with this turtle. And it really transformed our experience of the pandemic to be working with someone so strong and brave and to be working with these wonderful people who are out there trying to mend the world. Remember what that time was like, this strange contagion. Nobody knew what brought it on. The pandemic was on us, but no one knew where it came from. No one knew what to do about it. Did it come in the mail? Did it come on the groceries? It, it was so horrible. And time itself seemed to stop for us, except for when we were with the turtles. So we masked up when we were in the hospital. And we went at least once a week, often more than that, to work with all the different turtles, but particularly with Fire Chief. We were also, at this time, volunteering with another group of heroes, including a librarian and uh, a retired science teacher who protect the nest of five species of turtles, three of whom are endangered closer to home. In back of this suburban development, right next to two baseball fields, a parking lot, and a bunch of porta potties, there's this paradise for native turtles. But the thing is, most turtle eggs never hatch. Something like 99% never make it to adulthood. Often the eggs are are laid in a bad place these days because we've made every place bad. Um, these, these snapping turtle eggs we dug up at the edge of a parking lot where the asphalt was going to make the temperature of the eggs too high. And even if the babies managed to hatch, the minute they did, they'd be out in the parking lot and get squished. So it was super important that these ladies protect these eggs. Um, even trees will, will kill turtle eggs. They'll send their roots into them to, to suck the moisture out. All kinds of critters dig them up, in, including dogs and little boys and girls. Um, and once the babies hatch, everyone wants to eat them. It's a hard world out there for these little tiny infants. So Matt and I were helping to protect these nests, and we were also releasing patients um, who had, had been healed. Some of them were little babies who'd been hatched out of mothers who'd been run over and in some cases killed. But even if a turtle is dead, you can help because you can take and incubate those eggs. And <laughs> Matt is releasing this wonderful guy. This guy, he was known at Turtle Rescue League as Chunky Chip. 
But in Marblehead, where he was from, everyone called him Tortzilla. <laughs> he was one of the patients whose stories were so wonderful, and we loved being able to release him. This is his story. He had come in with a fish hook injury. Um, turtles often will bite on fish hooks, and he had done this three times in as many years. He was a repeat offender at TRL. And this was his second time um, in their hospital. And when he was finally released, he was so beloved in his town that there was a story about him in their local paper. There was actually a story in the ledger about him. And all the neighborhood came out to greet him when he was returned to his pond when he was healed. But our favorite was working with the fire chief. Our job, once the busy spring season was over and we were done releasing all those patients and we weren't busy uh, protecting the nests and we weren't digging up uh, nests that were in inappropriate places, was that me? No. Um, we got the happy job of doing physical therapy for a 42-pound, 65-year-old snapping turtle. And this was awesome. I want to read to you from the book from the first time that we took him out of his hospital tank and put him on the ground. I should tell you also, the very first time I met him, Natasha had taken the lid off his hospital tank and dropped in a whole banana. Well, he murdered that banana. His head lurched out. I thought, I wrote down in my notebook, it was as, as big as my thigh, his head, which it wasn't. But he just looked enormous. He looked really scary. But Matt right away recognized he had what he called a wild appeal. <laughs> so here we are taking him out for his first session in physical therapy. Matt hefts the huge turtle over the lip of the tank and into a travel case on the cement floor. Fire Chief's bulk completely fills the bin. To carry him safely up the stairs, we try to snap a lid on top, but his enormous head pops the seal and pops out, looking like T-Rex from the movie Lost World. With both Natasha and I pushing hard to urge his head back down and hold the lid shut, Matt walks up the stairs from the basement, through the living room, and out to the deck. Here, he lifts the huge, scrabbling reptile out of his container and hauls him over the three-foot wooden fence to the turtle garden. Fire Chief is even more magnificent out of water than in. His head is as big as Tortzilla's. His neck is muscular, not fat. His 14-inch long tail sports 11 tall, proud brown osteoderms, which are bony, tooth-like ridges rising skyward, rather like Stegosaurus's spikes on his tail, but his are rounded, not sharp. His shell is an unusual, gorgeous reddish-brown, the color that Matt knows from his artist palette and I from the 1966 deluxe Crayola pack as burnt sienna. The idea today, Natasha says, is to let him experience full gravity which he hadn't done since his injury in 2018. He seems eager to do this. The turtle garden's about the size of a big elementary school. It has flowers and ferns and grass and vinca, fallen leaves, a mulberry tree, a blueberry bush, tunnels lined with sand to crawl through, and a small pool hopping with frogs. Fire Chief's neck stretches out powerfully and his scaly forefeet pull him forward five, 10, 15 paces, 20, heading towards the edge of the fence. His mind is obviously clear. There's no head injury here. He's curious, active, focused, but his walk still isn't normal. His front legs are strong, but his back legs are weak so his plastron is dragging along the ground. Matt picks him up to examine the plastron to see if he's got any kind of scratches or injuries. And he's fine. And we put him down. He sits quietly as if he's thinking. And then suddenly, 
Matt and I spontaneously feel the same urge at once. Something compels us to do what nobody with any sense should attempt, to reach out and touch the front end of a giant wild snapping turtle who we hardly know. I'm not thinking of him murdering that banana. My mind is just filled with this particular individual at this particular moment and how much Matt and I admire and care for him. Fire Chief has enjoyed his time outside with us as much as we have. We've made a connection. Matt and I each reach out a hand. Matt strokes his neck and I touch the surprisingly soft skin near his armpit. You're a big banana cream pie, Matt says to him softly. <clears throat> Finally, with our fingers, we stroke his mighty head. And that afternoon, in the midst of the horrible pandemic, where time has stopped, our country in a big mess, the world on fire, nonetheless, Matt and I drive home full of hope and promise. Well, our hope, of course, was that Fire Chief would be able to return to the wild, because this is what we had been able to do with all these other turtles. And we knew it would take a miracle. His back legs had been paralyzed, but we'd seen so many miracles. And one of them happened at our own house and in my own hands. I'm going to tell you about my four baby painting, uh, painted turtles who I raised with a permit from the state for release in the wild. Being painted turtles, they were named Monet, Manet, Bonard, and Surratt. <laughs> so these little guys, they're like the size of a coin. They, they, you get them and they weigh like five grams. And we raised them up over the winter. Normally they would just be hibernating or brumating and they would wake up and they'd be little itty bitty guys who hadn't eaten anything and hadn't grown all winter. When we release them, having taken care of them, they're a little bit bigger. So fish can't eat them, frogs can't eat them. Still great blue herons can eat them and minks can eat them, a lot of things can eat them, but they've got a head start. So this is called head starting. Well, I love my little guys so much. And thank God Howard let me bring four turtles into the house. He thought they were just going to sit in a bucket. I don't know why. Before he figured out that wasn't the case, I ran out to PetSmart and bought $200 worth of stuff, including a giant tank and a heater and a lamp. And every morning, I loved making the sunrise for my little guys. I would turn on their UV heat lamp. And I didn't handle them a lot, but I knew every one of them very well. And I knew if I put a rock over here, I knew exactly which turtle would enjoy that. So one morning in February, I turn on the, the lamp, and I only see three turtles. And Surratt is there, and Bonard is there, and Manet was there, but Monet was missing. And he couldn't get out of the tank, so what had happened? And I practically tore the tank apart, and then I found him stuck under a suction cup that had freakishly come undone from the side of the tank that was holding their basking platform in place. Oh my God, he was dead. His eyes were shut, his neck was limp, he wasn't breathing, he had drowned. Well, I did not give up on this turtle because I had seen miracles before. For 45 minutes, I did CPR on that baby turtle. And he came back to life. And here he is with Howard and me being released in the spring with all of his brothers. So never give up on a turtle. Never give up. So with the chief, we had hope. There were times when he needed a wheelchair. So we made him a wheelchair with the help of some of our neighbors um, who made suggestions, Alexia created these wheels that would help him move along when he couldn't be outside. He could still do his exercises indoors. There were times when we also used a sling to get him along. And 
every time we were together, he clearly was excited and wanted to be out and wanted to use his legs. Well, this bulldozer is going to come into the picture. I don't want to spoil the entire book for you, but things end well for Fire Chief, although not exactly what you might expect. This is Matt, and this is the world's smallest bulldozer with a, it looks like a grapefruit spoon could have done a faster job, <laughs> but Fire Chief did live to command his own pond again. <laughs> so I get to see him every day if I want to. Matt now lives up the street from us. He lived in New Ipswich. That was too far, so we had to find him a place on Antrim Road so that we could all be together. Um, and uh, he's now, he started the book with three turtles, I think, and now he has 14. So God bless his wife. <laughs> well, the thing about Fire Chief, he's such a great soul, and his life has value on its own. Turtles, as all animals, love their lives like we love ours. But he's also a wonderful ambassador because everybody loves him. People are afraid of snapping turtles, but not him. He's such a sweetheart. Turtles are all individuals. They all matter. And when I was doing the octopus book, one of the things that broke my heart constantly is these animals only live three to five years. But Fire Chief is still going to be doing the turtle ministry long after I'm gone. These guys can live well over 100 years. Turtles, as you know, are one of the most ancient creatures on our planet, having arisen with the dinosaurs. They've survived so much. The asteroid impact 66 million years ago, ice ages. But they may not survive us. They are also, very few people realize, one of the most endangered kinds of animals in the world, and they are the most endangered terrestrial group of vertebrates. Most people think turtles are fine because you drive by the pond and there's tons of, of turtles piled on a log. But there's over 350 different kinds of turtles. You saw some of the wild turtles that are out there. And over 60% of them are in danger of extinction. <clears throat> there's many stories around the world that tell us how important turtles are. The world turtle is a story that persists across different cultures. Native Americans call North America Turtle Island because we actually have the most turtle species of any of the continents. But we might be Turtle Island no more because of the threats these animals face. This is the last Penta Island tortoise, Lonesome George, the last of his kind who died just a few years ago. That's why he was named Lonesome George. And so many species of turtles are actually already extinct in the wild and persist only because they are being taken care of in assurance colonies, hoping for that day when it is safe to set them free again. That's one reason why we wrote this book to make everyone know that they can be a turtle hero, to remember, never give up on a turtle, and so that we can be inspired by turtles to take our turn of holding this beautiful world which desperately needs turtles in it, a constant source of wildness and wonder right at hand, right in our neighborhood. So thank you so much. Thank you, Cy. Uh, we have time for some questions, including from people online. And we do have a number of people joining us online. Who would like to go first? Don't be shy. Don't yes, be afraid. Yes, stand up, please. 
you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, when you say that they heal themselves, are they capable of regenerating legs and shells and everything? Um, they can't regenerate an entire limb. They can regenerate their shells, like our bones. Um, many people learn from cartoons incorrectly that turtles can come out of their shells. They can't. It's part of their skeleton. It's fused to their skeleton and their ribs. Um, but they can fill in that entire, all of those cracks. And often they can do it on their own because if you find turtles in the wild, lots of them have healed cracks and healed broken jaws. They can't regenerate their uh, claws or their toes or their legs. But uh, they get along just fine on three legs and sometimes just on two legs. And one thing I learned from Natasha is, you know, disability does not have to stop you from living a, a full and, and vigorous life. And turtles really show us that. Do turtles get to know you as an individual? You talked a lot about that in the activist book. Yes, turtles absolutely get to know you. Now, some of them don't care. I mean, some of them, there, there were some snappers that we worked with, and every time you saw them for like three years, they, they would be like, who the hell are you? you know? um, but Fire Chief clearly recognized us. And um, Pizza Man, who came up and, and introduced himself to everyone and welcomed everyone. He was such a great host. I mean, he, he was outgoing. But even those who aren't outgoing probably do recognize us. They're way smarter than people think. They're just starting to explore how smart these turtles are and the kinds of memories that they have. And if you can live 288 years, think of the memories that, <laughs> that you've got. In the northern latitudes, how do turtles, I presume they must hibernate. Yes, they, they it's called the oh, sorry. Um, how do turtles in the, the north make it through the winter? Um, they do hibernate. We call it brumation in reptiles. And during that time, some of them bury themselves in the mud of ponds. Some of them just bury themselves in, in the forest. Um, those who are underneath the water um, have a special talent, and they can breathe through their butts because their lungs aren't functioning, but they're absorbing oxygen through the water um, directly through the skin of their cloaca, which is quite the talent. <laughs> yes, stand up, please, so we can hear you. How does one do CPR on a turtle? <laughs> I am so glad that you asked that. And interestingly, since I've been talking about this book with Matt, I know of two people who have successfully done CPR on a turtle that they heard me describe. So all of you are now deputized to go out. Okay, you take, you take their arms and legs, or you know, their front and back legs, and you just pump them like this. And it, will, it often will start their heart and clear out their lungs. And periodically, you can turn them upside down and water might come out of their, their mouth. It did not with, with Monet. Um, I never saw any water come out. But, and I did it for 45 minutes before I saw any sign this was working. But I reckoned he wasn't getting any deader than he already was. So, um, you know, never give up on a turtle. They, and, you know, turtles, sometimes it's hard to tell if your turtle is dead or alive to the point that there's an online resource for turtle owners. There's a, a whole section that's titled, How to Tell if Your Turtle is Dead. <laughs> so, you know, it may not be too late. <laughs> Matt, can I get you to come stand up next to Cy? Sure. Would you mind? And He's a major turtle nerd. <laughs> and if anyone has a question for Matt, now's the time. Yes, stand up, please. Matt, I want to know, if you spend all this time with the turtles. How do you find time to do your beautiful artwork? <laughs> Well, it goes in waves, um, but spending time with the turtles and seeing them out in the wild and observing them and seeing how they move and where they live and, and how they bask um, really helps my art. So it's a balance. I don't know how you do it all. It, we, we did it. We researched this for what three, three years? Three years. Yeah, and then did all the art. So. <laughs> And almost every animal he has painted or drawn for the book is an animal he personally knew. A lot of them are, yeah. 
Is that your painting that we're looking at? It is. She's nesting. Uh, Ed, anybody online ask on the chat line? Let us know. Yes, please. Is, is Pizza Man a house pet? He, he, is, a, he is a pet. Um, his story is interesting. He was rescued from a drug dealer's house, um, <laughs> and he lives, he lives in their house. He, he, he kind of has free, free uh, range. What, what does he do in the house? <laughs> well, he, he greets people. And <laughs> yeah. He also, he's hungry for stuff. Um, he, huh. he stands sometimes on the dishwasher when it's open, hoping that there's like a scrap of food for him to eat. If you bring in your, your purse and put it on the ground, if it's a big purse, he'll go in there looking to see what's in there. He's very curious. Yeah, and he, he makes a lot of noises. Uh, turtles are very vocal, and he makes almost like chicken sounds, like yeah. clucking noises. And, yeah. and you hear his There was, a, his there was a, a study recently done, um, and it was published in Nature Magazine, and they studied, uh, they tested 50 different species of turtles and all 50 were recorded using sound to communicate. So turtles do make noises, turtles do talk. You've heard them if you've ever seen Jurassic Park. <laughs> you, know, you know the sound of the Velociraptor? Uh -huh. That's tortoises having sex. Uh -huh. So a question for either of you. So what do we do if we come across an injured turtle on the side of the road? Well, that's a good question. There's, Thank uh, you, Michelle. In, in New Hampshire, there, there's uh, wildlife rehabbers, turtle rehabbers. In New Hampshire, we have uh, New Hampshire Turtle Rescue, and most states have on the Fish and Game website a list of, of rehabbers. Um, so you can call, call a rehabber, they can pick it. Even if you come across a dead turtle, if it's in the spring and it's a female, there's a good chance that there's eggs in it, and those eggs can be saved. Uh, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about the painting? What, what, are, what mediums? Do you work with photographs? Do you work with how do you... Yeah, well, this is um, a nesting eastern painted turtle. It's a scene we saw a lot when we were working in the nesting, the nesting site. I work with acrylics, um, and like I was saying, I, I go out in the field a lot, and I watch and observe turtles. I do sketches of them. I take notes. I take different photos of different angles of their legs and, and different behaviors they're doing, and I kind of combine all that together to make the illustrations. Um, and this, the same with like the, the plants in the background. I have a question. Can you tell us what turtles do to contribute to make the world safer, better? Uh, you yeah. know, we are yeah. familiar with the benefits that animals provide. But in addition to longevity and beauty, what else do they do for us? Well, turtles, turtles are really the foundation for a lot of ecosystems. There are gopher tortoises, they live in the south, and they're keystone species. They make these 30-foot uh, burrows, and over 360 other species of animals completely rely on them to survive. There's turtles that are seed dispersers. There's sea turtles that eat jellyfish to, to keep the population of jellyfish down, or sponges on coral reefs. Even all those eggs that are eaten, all that energy is going back into that system. And all those other animals and plants really rely on that to survive. So, so turtles are really one of the foundations of everything. So all those stories of the world turtle holding up the world on its back have truth to them. Yes? Um, so years back. Um, I was at a writing and clay retreat, and um, we were going out to the dunes, and all of a sudden, we started seeing these um, smooshed baby turtles. And, uh, and then we discovered that they were just crawling out of a hole, having just come out of their eggs. Um, so we were trying to rescue them so they wouldn't get run over. Um, but it was by the ocean. Is it likely that there would be like a fresh water? Um, they looked like snapping turtles. Um, <coughs> and I, you know. Yeah, they, they may have been snappers. Uh, this was, what state was it? Massachusetts. Oh, it was Massachusetts. Yeah, Cape yeah, yeah. because as you know, we do have sea turtles here, but they don't nest on our beaches. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we, we actually did a sea turtle rescue. They wash up on our beaches in the winter sometimes, cold stunned. But so if they were snapping babies, turtles... Um, these babies would have found their way to um, fresh water? Well, one would hope, but... Or they, they could have been... Uh, Cape Cod is the most northern population oh, of, of terrapins, diamondback terrapins, which are brackish water, where salt water meets fresh water, so they could have been those too. But if they were right at the edge of a, of a road um, and they were trying to cross that road, you were smart to cross them because, you know, probably turtles can't even process the sight of a rolling car. Right. Well, it they, was like a road in the dunes, you know, from just um, dune buggies or... Oh, gosh, so they were being run over by dune buggies. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Your wonderful book. Shy about the dancing cockatoo. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And I like what that um, said about the sounds. Have, have any turtles, um, do they like music? Do they wiggle their fannies or do they respond? <laughs> In case you don't know, this woman is a musician. Yeah. <laughs> do turtles Virginia. like music? Virginia, they would like your music. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Uh, yes. I, I live in Ranch, and um, when my mom and stepdad bought the property, there were always a number. We'd always see a number of snapping turtles in the in the spring, um, and I haven't seen any since I moved up here three years ago, and I'm just wondering if we know what the population of snapping turtles in this area, what, what's going on with that? Well, snapping turtles aren't one of the threatened species. They're one of the species doing better than others, but like all turtles, they are having trouble. Um, they're threatened by roads and, and habitat loss and pollution and poaching. So. You know. Ranch has had a lot of building, yeah. and you know, um, it's. Well, I want to thank both of you, and after David Beltet says a word, I invite you, please, come upstairs. Nobody has to buy a book. Enjoy the treats, liquid refreshment. Those of you who would like a book, we have the authors here, and they'll be glad to sign the books and chat. David. David Beltet, everyone, is the chairman of the board of the Jaffe Civic Center. Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're really proud of this series, and uh, we hope you folks consider come returning for some of our other uh, uh, speakers during the rest of this winter. And also, on the behalf of the board, I would like to give Cy and Matt a small token oh of my appreciation. Gosh. Nothing oh. great, it's just, but we're so proud to have you here. Oh, yay! No, better. <laughs> Maple syrup! Thank you, David. And next month, first <gasps> Friday moves. of December, Dan no. Scully is going to talk about his architecture in the face of a mountain. I don't know what mountain it is, but <laughs> please come and thanks for being here today. <laughs>